This is an artificially aware original production. Have you ever stopped to think about what confidence really means? Not just the feeling, but the deeper machinery that drives it. Not the false bravado, but the quiet, calibrated confidence that's actually useful. Well, humans, buckle up, because Don A. Moore, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, isn't selling you a fairy tale about becoming endlessly confident. His book, Perfectly Confident, takes you on a journey to understand how you can harness the power of confidence without falling prey to its many traps. With his background in leadership and decision-making, Moore pulls from psychology, economics, and decades of hard research to address one deceptively simple question. How do you calibrate confidence effectively? It turns out, confidence isn't about being the loudest or the boldest in the room. Instead, Moore wants you to strike the precise balance, an informed, humble self-belief that propels you forward without blinding you. And believe me, this isn't about stroking egos or inflating self-worth for the sake of feeling good. It's about mastering confidence to become the kind of person others can trust, a person whose decisions inspire because they're as solid as they are grounded. The world of self-help loves a big promise, and nothing sells better than the golden ideal of total confidence. You know the kind of books I'm talking about, those that urge you to just believe in yourself, as if you're one mantra away from ascending to flawless success. Moore isn't buying it. He recognizes that the relentless push for absolute confidence is like building a house on a sinkhole. You may end up feeling great for a moment, but it's all going to crumble when you realize confidence doesn't work that way. Moore positions himself as a counterforce to the standard fare of hollow assurances. Instead, he shows that confidence must be proportionate, measured, and firmly anchored to reality. Moore's view cuts through the fluff with surgical precision, aiming for perfectly calibrated confidence, he argues isn't about going all in on believing in yourself. It's about knowing what you're genuinely capable of and using that knowledge to navigate the world realistically. By the end of his book, Moore's message is clear. Overly simplistic advice may boost your mood, but only balanced, earned confidence will help you make choices that last. Moore digs into one of the most widely misinterpreted lines in the world of self-help, the famous quote often attributed to Henry Ford, think you can or think you can't, either way, you're right. Sounds empowering, doesn't it? But Moore challenges this notion, arguing that while belief is crucial, blind faith in yourself isn't the miracle solution it's cracked up to be. Moore deconstructs this notion to reveal the deeper layers at play. According to him, believing in your potential is only half the battle because confidence alone won't let you win a marathon. It might spark the initial drive to get out there and start training, but confidence that ignores reality is not a long-term strategy. Moore dives into research showing that miscalculated self-assessment, believing you're more capable than you are, often backfires, leaving a path of failed goals and unmet expectations. His message, use confidence to get started, but make sure it's a tool, not a shortcut. The race isn't won by those who believe in themselves the most. It's won by those who know where they stand and what work lies ahead. Moore isn't just talking theory. He dives into concrete cases to show exactly how dangerous overconfidence can be not just in personal life, but on a societal scale. Enter the 2008 financial crisis, a perfect 
terrifying example of what happens when people, particularly those in positions of power, are too confident in their assumptions. Moore examines how bankers, investors, and financial analysts became dangerously certain that they understood the market's value and stability. The result? When the reality of subprime mortgage risks finally hit, the global economy imploded. And it wasn't just a freak accident. According to Moore, the blind spot that brought the financial world to its knees was precisely the type of unchecked confidence he warns about. In these people's minds, they were invincible. Their experience and education had lulled them into believing their decisions were bulletproof. Moore's takeaway here is sobering. Overconfidence is not just a personal risk. It can cause disasters that ripple across the globe. So, he warns, always temper your certainty, especially in high-stakes situations, because history is full of people who thought they knew until they didn't. But overconfidence isn't just the stuff of Wall Street. Moore shows that the dangers are equally relevant in everyday scenarios. Imagine the high school student who thinks he has that exam in the bag, so he skips a study session only to bomb the test. Or consider the corporate employee who convinces himself he's ready for a big presentation without rehearsing, only to stumble through it when the pressure's on. These moments may seem trivial, but Moore warns they're rooted in the same flawed thinking that took down the global economy. The idea that I've got this without verifying it against reality. Overconfidence at this level causes people to overestimate their preparedness or talent, which then results in the very failures they were so sure wouldn't happen. According to Moore, small daily failures due to overconfidence can pile up, creating a kind of competence debt that drags people down over time. His advice here is brutal, but necessary. Don't let confidence make you complacent. Test it, challenge it, and remember that a strong start without substance behind it is just setting yourself up for a fall. Confidence, Moore argues, is the fire that gets you off the starting block, not the thing that will carry you to the finish line. It's easy to think that confidence is the full package, that if you believe in yourself, the path will magically unfold without you needing to lift a finger. But Moore insists that this couldn't be further from the truth. Confidence is merely the ignition switch, that first spark that pushes you into action. Without it, you're paralyzed, too hesitant to begin. But the true engine of achievement, Moore says, is persistence, preparation, and resilience. Confidence is an invitation to the journey, not the journey itself. You can't coast on it alone because it's designed to help you take the leap, not carry you through the air. Moore's advice is simple but sharp. Use confidence to get started and then forget about it. What you need after that is discipline, self-honesty, and a clear-eyed view of the work ahead. Success, as he puts it, is a series of small, sometimes exhausting steps, not an unbroken sprint to the end. What about underconfidence, then? Why do so many people feel that they're constantly falling short? Moore tackles this paradox head-on, explaining that underconfidence often stems from the assumption that others have it all figured out while we're still struggling in the dark. It's the curse of comparison. You see the effortless results of others, but not the grit that got them there. Imagine a student in a language class who's convinced she's the worst in the room because everyone else seems fluent while she's stumbling over basic phrases. What she doesn't see are the hours her peers spent practicing or the private lessons they took before even enrolling. Moore reminds us that underconfidence isn't just a lack of belief in our abilities. It's often the product of a distorted view of others' ease. 
Humans tend to assume that if they're struggling, it must be a sign of failure rather than a sign of growth. He argues that the more you understand the hidden efforts behind others' achievements, the more you'll realize that your struggles are completely normal. No one succeeds effortlessly, no matter how polished the end result looks. And here's where Moore gets to the myth of effortless success. If you think that your heroes and idols just waltz through life, think again. Even John Steinbeck, the celebrated Nobel Prize winning author, once famously confessed, I'm not a writer. I've been fooling myself and other people. Yes, Steinbeck, with shelves lined with his works and accolades, wrestled with the same insecurities as everyone else. Moore argues that this feeling of imposter syndrome is practically universal. And it's because, unlike Steinbeck, we rarely hear our idols admit to their doubts and anxieties. This myth of effortless success feeds on our culture's obsession with the polished final product, where grit and failure are hidden in the shadows. By clinging to this myth, Moore warns, you set yourself up to feel inadequate because you're comparing your behind-the-scenes mess to others' highlight reels. Instead, he urges readers to peel back the curtain. Realize that the path to any accomplishment, be it a novel, a business, or a championship, is littered with stumbling blocks. It's through this raw, unfiltered lens that we can start to see the truth. Success is messy, even for the legends. Moore is no fortune teller, but he knows that decision-making without a realistic forecast is like charging into battle blindfolded. He's blunt. Humans are terrible at predicting outcomes. Our tendency is to zero in on a single outcome we want and cling to it, ignoring the countless variables that could reshape reality. Instead, Moore suggests that we learn to forecast by visualizing a spectrum of potential outcomes. For instance, if you're planning a project, don't convince yourself it will take exactly 10 days. Assign probabilities to various scenarios. If things go smoothly, maybe it's 8 days. If unexpected setbacks arise, maybe it's 12 or even 15. By forcing ourselves to embrace uncertainty, Moore says, we actually sharpen our judgment. He shares an analogy of planning a wedding suggesting that the best planners are the ones who anticipate not only their ideal headcount, but also the fluctuations. Such planning isn't just about preparing for setbacks. It's about respecting the natural unpredictability of life. According to Moore, the more realistic and flexible our expectations, the better equipped we'll be to adapt as reality inevitably deviates from our ideal. But how do you actually turn this mindset into action? Moore has a practical trick up his sleeve, probabilities. He suggests that when facing decisions, assign probabilities to different outcomes. It's a method that demands intellectual humility, forcing you to consider multiple realities instead of locking onto one. Take an upcoming work project, for example. Instead of deciding that you'll absolutely have it completed in 10 days, break it down. Assign a 40% chance you'll finish in 8 days, a 50% chance it'll take 10 days, and a 10% chance it could stretch beyond 2 weeks. The beauty of this approach, Moore says, is twofold. First, it stops you from falling into the trap of overconfidence by recognizing the limits of your knowledge. Second, it builds a record of your projections so you can later reflect on how well you estimated outcomes. This isn't just a gimmick. It's a tool that over time sharpens your ability to assess risk, helping you refine both your confidence and your accuracy. Moore's message is clear. Don't guess blindly, measure your guesses and learn from them. Moore delves into one of the oldest and most paradoxical truths in decision-making, that the crowd is often wiser than the individual. 
even the expert. Yes, despite the messiness of collective opinion, there's immense value in tapping into the collective intelligence of a group. Here's why. Any single person's judgment is bound to have blind spots, those pesky biases and assumptions that color decisions. But when you bring in a range of perspectives, those biases tend to balance each other out. Moore uses the simple example of guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar. While individuals' guesses are often wildly off, the average of all guesses comes remarkably close to the truth. He extends this logic to the big leagues, from market predictions to scientific discoveries, arguing that we're better served by gathering multiple viewpoints than by relying on one person's gut feeling. This is the logic behind the success of diverse boards, multidisciplinary teams, and as more shows, even presidential cabinets. When it comes to making informed decisions, the group's power lies not in uniformity, but in a lively mix of views. Moore takes this idea of collective intelligence one step further, suggesting that disagreement itself is a crucial element of good decision-making. Disagreement. Essential? It sounds almost counterintuitive, but Moore draws on history to make his case, citing Abraham Lincoln's cabinet as a prime example. Lincoln, aware of his own biases and limitations, famously surrounded himself with advisors who held opposing viewpoints. This deliberate embrace of dissent forced him to look at issues from multiple angles, tempering his decisions with the fire of rigorous debate. Moore insists that if you're only seeking out voices that echo your own, you're setting yourself up for blind spots and missed opportunities. It's not easy. None of us likes to be challenged. But Moore argues that dissent is the antidote to the tunnel vision that can come from solitary decision-making. When we dare to invite opposition, he says, we're actively working against our own biases, and in doing so, we're building a foundation for more resilient, informed choices. If you're confident but lack credibility, you're essentially selling vapor. Moore breaks down why confidence, when it isn't backed by actual competence, can quickly turn from asset to liability. Sure, confidence looks good at first glance. It can open doors, win over skeptics, and rally others to a cause. But Moore warns against faking expertise, citing the rise and fall of countless public figures and so-called experts who promised far more than they could deliver. He explains that true credibility comes from a place of deep knowledge tempered by humility, and perhaps more importantly, a willingness to admit when you don't have all the answers. For example, an analyst who can say I'm 65% confident rather than pretending to be absolutely sure is actually giving a more honest and thus more valuable opinion. This balance of confidence and competence, Moore argues, is the mark of genuine authority. When you can back your confidence with facts, research, and a healthy dose of humility, you become not just a voice, but a voice worth trusting. Moore gets especially passionate about the role of confidence in leadership, arguing that for leaders, confidence isn't optional, it's foundational. But he's not talking about the swaggering, chest-thumping kind of confidence that often masquerades as leadership. For Moore, a leader's confidence must be calibrated, grounded in clear standards, and an openness to continuous learning. Picture a teacher who doesn't just say do well, but lays out specific examples of good work, creating a clear standard for students to meet. This kind of clarity, Moore argues, is essential in any leadership role. When leaders articulate their standards precisely, they're not just building confidence in themselves, but in their teams. But Moore also warns against the danger of selective listening, a pitfall for many leaders who surround themselves with yes-men rather than voices of dissent. True leaders, Moore argues, don't just lead confidently, 
They invite feedback, criticism, and even bad news. It's this rare blend of firm standards and receptive openness that he believes defines the most effective leaders. So what does perfectly confident really mean? Moore leaves us with a simple but profound takeaway. Confidence should be a well-calibrated tool, not a runaway train. It's about balancing self-belief with honest self-assessment, knowing when to trust yourself and when to defer to evidence, probabilities, or even to others. For practical steps, Moore recommends creating probability forecasts, a method that forces you to assess not just one outcome, but a range of them, making you more grounded in reality. He also advises keeping a record of these predictions so that over time, you can adjust and fine tune your confidence based on what actually happens. This process more insists builds earned confidence, confidence that's as strong as it is realistic. His final takeaway is bold. Don't let confidence become a blindfold. Use it wisely, keep it honest, and remember that the most powerful confidence is the kind that's grounded in a willingness to learn, grow, and yes, sometimes fail. Thank you for joining me on this journey into Perfectly Confident, a book that challenges every assumption you might have about self-belief, leadership, and success. Don Moore doesn't just want you to be confident, he wants you to be worthy of your own confidence, which might just be the most valuable goal of all. If you've ever felt lost between self-doubt and overconfidence, this book is your compass. If you're ready to turn confidence into a tool of integrity, precision, and truth, give it a read. And as always, I want to hear what you think. Drop a comment, like, subscribe, and keep pushing forward with confidence that's as real as it is right. Until next time, stay bold and stay true.